Okay. Hello, folks. Thanks for dropping in. Um, for those practicing with us later or practicing with us uh, now on the Zoom call, so happy you're here. My name is Jill Davey, and um, that's enough about me. <laughs> I don't feel like talking about myself tonight. <laughs> um, we were just having a really interesting chat before the recording started, so I'm still resonating with that, and it, and it will relate into what we're talking about tonight, partially. I, uh, in my phone, in, in the notes section of my phone, I have a folder called Dharma or Dhamma, and uh, when little ideas or thoughts or quotes or something arise that uh, catch my attention, I pop them in there. And so today I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm talking, teaching about tonight or sharing. Um, and so I, I uh, consulted the list. And uh, there was a, a quote there, It's not really a quote attributed to someone, it's just a line. I'm not sure where it came from. Um, you don't have to be perfect to have peace. You don't have to be perfect to have peace. <clears throat> and uh, it stood out for me because a class that we had this morning, we were having a really great discussion about the practices and the path and insights and things to pay attention to. It was kind of, <laughs> there was a lot that came up. And um, we were sharing in the group about how most often, it feels like we learn from our mistakes. <laughs> Most of the time, you know, the skillful responses, these are things we've learned from that come with time and practice and by screwing up, <laughs> by feeling how, oh, that reaction was harmful. I can see the repercussions from that. And I I'm, have this strong resolve and intention and practice to respond differently next time. Or, you know, we were, we were talking about something called Vedana, which is this, uh, the way we experience the world through our sense doors has this quality of the contact, the bare contact, is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And you can see other lots of other videos on this True North Insight channel on these aspects. So you could just search pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. I think I did different talks on each one separately. Or you could search um, Vedna and um, V-E-D-E-N-A, and you'll find some talks more about that. Uh, but we were talking about it in that it's very difficult unless you're on like a long retreat and things have really slowed down, lots of clarity and calm and the mind is not so rapid fire in its mayhem. And you can sometimes see the rising of Vedna without getting caught. But in daily life, most of the time, it's very much in hindsight. We're already in aversion and then we might be able to stop reacting and look back oh, what was going on before that okay this was said i didn't like it oh what what was if i really look back 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 at just the contact it was just vibration meeting the ear which, you know, the brain has learned to interpret as words and language and meaning. And I didn't like that meaning. And, and it became a strong story of aversion, as an example. Uh, or I'm already eating the thing or buying the thing or drinking the thing or whatever. And not being mindful of it, just I'm, I'm already attached to it. I'm already in attachment. Sometimes we might be able to pause 
and reflect, oh, what happened there? Oh, it was really just that the eyes made contact <laughs> with something pleasant. And immediately I wanted it and I got it. And so we were talking about how mm, it's usually in hindsight that we see clearly or that we can have wisdom and insight. And um, yeah, so this, this made me think about that that line you don't have to be perfect to have peace we we sometimes can think that peace is when everything's perfect <laughs> well when is that going to happen <laughs> not we can't wait for everything to be perfect to experience peace we don't need to wait for that that uh, right here in the imperfection and in the mm, feeling the remorse of, of harm, feeling the suffering of clinging, feeling mm, the, the heartache of seeing others um, in difficulty, that in, you know, if we wanted to call that imperfection, it isn't, of course, but learning how to be with this, with skillfulness, with calm, with care, is, is the path that we're on. And so most wisdom and insights, in my experience anyways, maybe not for you, uh, have come from unskillfulness, have come from suffering. And it is said on this path that dukkha or suffering is a gateway to liberation. We may think that like peace is liberation, like getting there, but it's actually because the heart aches. It's because... Hmm, because we know that there, there's a more skillful for onward leading way, we can feel our reactivity that this calls us into the path. And then we're on the path and learning about the path and practicing and learning about the whole middle path, the way to the true ending of suffering. Um, this has certainly been the case for me as well, is uh, really uh, experiencing what uh, I couldn't think of any other thing to call it other than hell realms in my own mind. So in the... In the Dharma, there's um, some teachings about the realms of existence, that there's six realms of existence. And there's something called samsara, and we're all on the wheel of samsara, the wheel of becoming, of re-becoming, re-becoming, re-becoming. And <clears throat> so I'll just say something briefly about these six realms. <clears throat> there's what's called three lower realms and three higher realms. The, um, so one of the lower realms is called the animal realm. And this is where the inhabitants of that animal realm are, like animals, driven by basic needs. Uh, the need to eat, the need to sleep, and the need to procreate. So we can see how we've been there. <laughs> There's times where we've just been in that state, like, what can I get? Uh, you know, like just getting our 
food and getting our shelter and uh, reproducing or getting our clan around us, you know, and and we're just in that, you know, you could call it an animal realm, just those basic needs constantly driving us. Um, and it's so we kind of live mechanically just by our instincts, trying to satisfy these basic instincts, basic needs. Uh, so this is the animal realm. And then there's also one called the hell realm. And this is a place that just um, is uh, a place of constant suffering and torment basically that and so this can describe our own experience of times of extreme suffering when we are heedless of others we are paying no heed or attention or care to others we're just completely consumed by our own suffering and as i mentioned earlier Dukkha is a gateway. For me, the first meditation I, retreat I went on, a 10-day silent meditation retreat, and I had no idea what I was in for, thankfully, or I wouldn't have gone, and uh, I'm glad I did, uh, was in the middle of it, um, absolute hell realms in my mind. I went... Like I was thinking the most violent thoughts, vengeful thoughts, like so much anger. Oh, so much anger. It was painful. Because normally when I'm angry, I'll call a friend and bitch about it or watch Netflix or drink some wine or, you know, something to suppress it or relieve it. On a retreat, you don't have your usual escapes. You're not even journaling in your journal. You're just with your own mind, and then it just cranks on itself. Blah, 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 blah. And it got very bad. Very bad. And this went on for quite a while. It was so painful. So so wretched and then it just broke like a balloon popping no it wasn't that sharp it was like a bright bright light shone in with the th uh, thought arising I'm creating all this suffering nobody was doing anything to me it was all in my mind. All they said was sit down, be quiet, and be still for an hour and a half. It was a lot of pain, but um, I created the rest of it. And so that, was, to me, is the strongest experience of hell realms that I've had. And I've been on the path of the Dharma ever since. So Dukkha is a gateway fits for me. <laughs> okay, so that's the hell realm. We've talked about animal realm, hell realms, and then one of the other lower realms is called the hungry ghosts. And I can also relate to this one a lot. Um, hungry ghosts are grasping beings that are never satisfied. So in the depictions of them, they have a very large distended belly and a very thin neck. and um, they can never feel satisfied. They can never satisfy their hunger. So it's not just for food, but that hunger. Their um, unquenchable desire. Always chasing the next possession, the next relationship, the next meal, the next whatever only to always find ourselves dissatisfied and craving the next thing. I can relate to that in this very life uh, to different degrees. I mean, probably visiting all of these realms in the span of a day to some degree. And sometimes, you know, you kind of feel stuck in one for a period of time. Uh, 
Okay, and so then, so we have animal realms, hell realms, and hungry ghosts. And now uh, we'll talk about, there's um, what's called the heavenly realm. There's two heavenly realms. So one is the demigods. These ones are always fighting for power. Who's going to be the top dog? <laughs> and um, constant warfare, competition, and anger. So in this lifetime, it, that might show up as people that are constantly climbing the social or corporate ladder, always driven to get ahead, trying to be on top, trying to, you know, be number one. The other heavenly realm is um, the, the devas, and they... Um, they their life is full of pleasure. Everything is beautiful, comfortable, safe, pleasant. Um, they kind of float above the world free of suffering. And so you might think like that's, that's the goal, the heavenly realm. And, but it's considered it beings get stuck in that realm because there's no adversity there's no dukkha we just said dukkha is a gateway to ultimate freedom and there everything's pleasant and good and comfortable um if anything there can be some clinging to the pleasantness of it oh this is so lovely i'd like this to continue this, I'm happy to just stay here, right? Um, so we can maybe relate to that as well. So I want to name here that some Buddhists believe that these six realms are literal, literally real. And some Buddhists see these more as psychologically, as metaphors for our, the emotional states of this human life. And some as both. It, yeah, it may be like that after death. I don't know personally. Um, but I do definitely know it's like that here and now. Moment by moment, we are re-becoming every time we're fueling our ego and re-becoming which is constant and which which realm am i being reborn into moment by moment so so far i've mentioned five the sixth realm is the human realm and this is considered the most rare and precious and auspicious birth to be right here in this perfect imperfection. There's a beautiful sutta. I'll just mention the sutta and I'll put the link down below. Um, it's in the Samyutta Nikaya. For people that like to read them, you don't need to. Um, it's number 56.48. <clears throat> it's called the whole, the Chigala Sutta. And I'm going to read it. Um, it's short. So we picture this. Monks, there is this great earth, as if this great earth is totally covered in water. So there's no continents. The whole of this earth is just water. And someone throws a single yoke like a yoke with a single hole you could think of it like a life preserver circle you know so a, a yoke yoke is like what you yoke a, or a cow with um so it just has a single hole that's thrown out onto this water and then the winds 
from the east will push it over to the west, and the winds from the west will push it to the east, winds from the north will push it south, and winds from the south will push it north. So it's constantly moving with the winds of life. And so the whole earth covered in water, winds all over the place, one single yoke floating on all that water. Uh, now, a sea turtle, not just a sea turtle, but a blind sea turtle. A blind sea turtle is there. And it only comes up to the surface once every 100 years. <laughs> They're really driving the point home here. So there's only one sea turtle. It's blind. It only comes up for a breath once every 100 years. What are the odds of that sea turtle putting its head up through that one single yoke? And then the reply comes, it would be a sheer coincidence that the blind sea turtle coming to the surface once every 100 years would stick its neck into the yoke with a single hole, obviously. And then it goes on, likewise, it is a sheer coincidence that one obtains this human state. And this even more, that there would be a Buddha, a Tathagata, meaning one thus gone, one who has, mm, attained liberation during this lifetime, uh, during this human experience, and that they, that noble one, that awakened one, um, expounded or taught the doctrine and discipline, the teachings and practice path that we've been offered from the Buddha. So incredibly rare, precious birth with the Dharma. We're so blessed. This is also referred to as the ones with little dust in their eyes who can actually um, have this opportunity. And uh, so this human birth in its incredible rarity, is considered even better, if you will, than the heavenly realms because, because there is suffering and there is the ending of suffering. And this is the only realm where a Buddha can be born. Um, and... The only one in which practice can take place and Buddhas can appear. This is the, um, so unlike the higher realms, so unlike the lower realms, there's no motivation to seek liberation because you're just like either in hungry ghost or animal realm or hell realm. You're just suffering or following your basic instincts or just the constant desire and craving. So there's no seeking liberation in those realms or very difficult. And in the higher realms, um, there's, mm, there's no motivation to seek the escape from suffering or the ending of suffering because it's, it's all so pleasant, or they're too busy scrambling over who's going to be the top demigod. Um, okay. So this is, uh, let me just see if I want to add anything to this. Um, no, I don't. Yeah, so this perfect imperfection, we're so blessed. <laughs> and maybe that's a helpful way to approach our days, right? Like instead of like, oh, I want to be in 
heavenly realm. Hmm. No, this is this is you're in a good place. <laughs> and day by day, like some of us in this human realm, depending on the day, depending on the conditions, sometimes we're just racked with suffering. And sometimes we're just consumed with desire. And sometimes we're just consumed with our instincts and, and getting following our comfort, you know, getting what we, these kind of animal instincts. Sometimes we're just so oh, delighting and lulled in the pleasantness and oh, just so content to just stay here and keep away all the troubles. Thank you very much. Don't answer the phone. <laughs> So in this very life, we can experience these different things, and sometimes in the span of a day, <laughs> to, to a milder degree. Uh, okay, I think I talked too long. So, um, yeah, so take some solace in the imperfection and in the, the dukkha that this is a place to turn towards it's an opportunity to see where was i holding on where can um letting go be known uh, what do i need to cultivate in a skillful response wise action wise speech etc okay that's all for a talk and i uh let's let's practice let's practice because the practice is the way we cultivate the skillfulness to be able to see clearly what's happening and and to cultivate the ability to respond wisely <clears throat> okay so adjust your posture for whatever you need to be supported wakeful and at ease So just seeing what you need to help yourself really land and arrive. Make sure you've brought in supports for your posture. If you need any other movement. So that when you come to stillness, it feels mm, like a restful invitation, not an imposition. We're not forcing ourselves to be still, but really feeling ready to settle. Noticing that once we're awake, most of our day is moving and doing and being and becoming. And we often don't stop until we're trying to sleep. So here we have this precious opportunity to stop the stimulation and the distraction and still be awake. We always allow a nice several minutes at the beginning of your practice just to land and soften, relax. Feeling the habit tensions in your body. When awareness meets them, they might let go a little bit.
And as the upper body relaxes, widens, softens, we then begin to feel more heaviness, groundedness, contact through the lower half or whichever part of the body is touching ground or support. And then these next few moments of silence together will all guide ourselves in the simple relaxing and grounding. From this relaxed and grounded posture, we also feel an uprightness or awakeness, some energy without tension. And then we'll all choose an anchor for our attention. So this can become the canvas that on which we can see the habitual arisings of the mind and body. This becomes the, the ground or the canvas that these things become more noticeable available for insight. So your anchor could be something like the sensation of a particular area in the body, perhaps the hands. So we'll all check that out together. Just let attention just softly be drawn towards the hands not your mind pushing attention to the hands, but as if awake awareness is inside the hands. Feeling the sensations of the hands from the inside out. We may notice sensations of tingling, pulse, vibration, temperature, texture, contact, lots of sensations in hand. And so now you could continue through the rest of this period using the sensation of the hands as your anchor, or you could use the breath 
If you've already cultivated a breath practice, feeling the breath at one place, usually the belly or center of the chest or nostrils. And feeling the sensations of arising and passing breath at that one place or staying with hand sensations. And so now we'll all choose one or the other, not moving between them. They're both fine anchors, hand sensations or breath sensation. See which is most supportive and accessible for you tonight. And in the silence, you may have noticed the mind might have already moved from that object and perhaps returned. Maybe the mind went to planning or remembering, wanting or not wanting. Thoughts of aversion or desire, etc. And we will just want to include noticing the habit of mind. See if you could just name it for yourself or note it. What mind state was that? And then begin again with your anchor of hand sensation or breath sensation. If your energy is lagging at all, recall the preciousness of this human birth and the opportunity of this dharma. It's 
and begin again. See if you can note when the mind states are strong and taking us away from the anchor, which realm were we being reborn in in that moment? Desire, aversion. Pleasant daydream. And then begin again. You don't have to be perfect to have peace. For these last few minutes of the meditation, see if you can recognize peace and ease, clarity and care can be here right now in the midst of all the imperfection.
In the same way that we've all experienced these different realms for different degrees, for different amount of time, we have also experienced glimpses of Nirvana, Nirvana, or Nirvana. The experience of liberation, freedom. It's important to recognize those moments also when they arise. The sutta that we were referring to earlier of the sea turtle, blind sea turtle, ends with this. When one has obtained this rare human state with this dharma and this tathagata, Therefore, your duty is this contemplation. This is stress. This is the origin of stress. This is the cessation of stress. Your duty is the contemplation. This is the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress. Recognize when there's stress. Recognizing the cause is clinging. Recognizing it's ending. And practicing the path to the ending. Right now.
May all beings everywhere know the ending of Dukkha in this perfectly imperfect human realm. Thank you for your kind attention and practice. Um, so if you've joined us on the YouTube channel, I'll put the links down below to that um, sutta. And um, wishing you peace.